Hey folks, Attorney Andrew Branca here from Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's always, always greatly appreciated. And we're back today for this edition of the Law of Self-Defense show, reading aloud a fantastic book, The Art of Cross-Examination by Attorney Francis Wellman. Now, Francis Wellman was an attorney in New York City in the early decades of the last century. This book was written in 1903 initially. Uh, this physical version of the book I hold was printed in 1948. Uh, so it's quite old, but it's a wonderful old-timey reflection of the art of cross-examination, which doesn't really change much because cross-examination is a function of human personality and character, and that essentially remains unchanged. What does change is people's manner of speaking and today we're going to proceed with the reading of chapter 5, which is cross-examination of experts. Before we dive into that, however, a word from our sponsor. If you've ever wondered what it would be like to have a lawyer-like understanding of the many high-profile trials and legal issues we cover, well, I've got exciting news. Our very own American Law Courses offer a wide variety of law school-level courses, including the foundational courses all lawyers take in their first year of law school at a fraction of the cost and time of law school and without the toxic political environment that so pervades law schools today. At American Law Courses, we simply teach traditional American law in the traditional American way to help Americans become the best informed, most capable citizens they can be. We have a broad curriculum of courses, including criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, property, constitutional law, and more. All courses are taught on a semester basis, roughly one live streamed class a week for 14 weeks with an optional final exam for certification at the end. Every class is taught by a genuine legal expert in the respective subject, and because the classes are live streamed, there's plenty of opportunity for real-time interaction and Q&A with the professor. If you can't make a particular class for some reason, no worries. Every class is also made available as a recorded playback, and you have access to that recording for a full year. We're currently in the pre-registration period for the spring 2023 semester, which starts the second week of January. And during this pre-registration period, you can save 50% on any and all American law courses. That's a savings of over $1,000 a course. So if you'd like to learn more, now would be the time to do so. Learn more about our American law courses, access the syllabus for each course, view interviews with our professors, and much more by simply pointing your browser to AmericanLawCourses.com today. All right, now time to continue with our reading of The Art of Cross-Examination by author and attorney Francis Wellman with Chapter 5, Cross-Examination of Experts. In these times when it is impossible to know everything, but becomes necessary for success in any vocation to know something of everything and everything of something, the expert is more and more called upon as a witness, both in civil and criminal cases. In these days of specialists, their services are often needed to aid the jury in their investigations of questions of fact relating to subjects with which the ordinary man is not acquainted. In our American courts, as they are now constituted, I think I am safe in saying that in half the cases presented to a jury, the evidence of one or more expert witnesses becomes a very important factor in a juror's effort to arrive at a just verdict. The proper handling of these witnesses, therefore, has become of greater importance at the present time than ever before. It is useless for our law writers to dismiss the subject of expert testimony, as is so often done, by quoting some authority like Lord Campbell, who gives it as his final judgment after the experience of a lifetime at the bar and on the bench that, quote, skilled witnesses come with such a bias on their minds to support the cause in which they are embarked that hardly any weight should be given to their evidence, close quote. Or, as Taylor even more emphatically puts it in the last edition of his treatise on the law of evidence, quote, Expert witnesses become so warped in their judgment by regarding the subject in one point of view that even when contentiously disposed, they are incapable of expressing a candid opinion. Close quote. 
The fact still remains that the testimony of expert witnesses must be reckoned with in about 60% of our most important litigated business in the only possible way to enlighten our jurors and enable them to arrive at a just estimate of such testimony is by a thorough understanding of the art of cross-examination of such witnesses. Although the cross-examination of various experts, whether medical, handwriting, real estate, or other specialists, is a subject of growing importance, yet it is not intended in this chapter to do more than to make some suggestions and to give a number of illustrations of certain methods that have been successfully adopted in the examination of this class of witnesses. It has become a matter of common observation that not only can the honest opinions of different experts be obtained upon opposite sides of the same question, but also that dishonest opinions may be obtained upon different sides of the same question. Attention is also called to the distinction between matters of scientific fact and mere matters of opinion. For example, Medical experts may be called to establish certain medical facts which are not mere matters of opinion. On such facts, the experts could hardly disagree. But in the province of mere opinion, it is well known that the experts differ so widely among themselves that but little credit is given to mere expert opinion as such. As a general thing, it is unwise for the cross-examiner to attempt to cope with a specialist in his own field of inquiry. Lengthy cross-examinations along the lines of the expert's theory are usually disastrous and should rarely be attempted. Many lawyers, for example, undertake to cope with a medical or handwriting expert on his own ground, be it surgery, correct diagnosis, or the intricacies of penmanship. In some rare instances, more especially with poorly educated physicians, this method of cross-questioning is productive of results. More frequently, however, it only affords an opportunity for the doctor to enlarge upon the testimony he has already given and to explain what might otherwise have been misunderstood or even entirely overlooked by the jury. Experience has led me to believe that a physician should rarely be cross-examined on his own specialty unless the importance of the case has warranted so close a study by the counsel of the particular subject under discussion as to justify the experiment. And then only when the lawyer's research of the medical authorities, which he should have with him in court, convinces him that he can expose the doctor's erroneous conclusions not only to himself, but to a jury who will not readily comprehend the abstract theories of the science upon which even the medical profession itself is divided. A very amusing illustration on this point when, quote-unquote, fools rush in where angels fear to tread, occurred in a rather recent case. An inexperienced young attorney was defending his client on a charge of murder, claiming that the death was the result of suicide and not homicide. An elderly German physician had made the autopsy and had testified that after a very careful examination of the course of the bullet as it entered and passed through the body, he was satisfied that it could not possibly have been self-inflicted. The witness offered diagrams illustrating his point, and if his opinion should be accepted by the jury, there could no longer be any question of suicide. The young attorney started his cross-examination by addressing the witness in a rather flippant and disrespectful manner, which naturally irritated the witness, somewhat along these lines. Attorney, doctor, you seem very certain about your findings in this case. You do not give it as your opinion that the wound in this case could not have been self-inflicted, but you state it as a matter of fact. Swear to it as a matter of fact. Now, I'd like to ask you, by any chance, is this the first autopsy you have ever made? I don't find your name anywhere in our local medical directory. The doctor, sitting back in his seat and answering very quietly, holding up one of his hands and apparently counting his fingers. Uh, no, I can say that I have made a previous autopsy. Attorney, apparently encouraged by this answer. Well, could you honestly say that you have made two aut autopsies, not counting this one? The doctor, again hesitating and again counting his open fingers, apparently reminiscing. Uh, yes, I, I think I can truthfully say that I have made two prior autopsies. The attorney, still more encouraged. Well, can you go so far as to say that you have made five autopsies? 
doctor, this time examining his outstretched hand very deliberately and apparently touching the tip of each finger as he counted up his cases before making a reply and then looking up pleasantly at the attorney. Yes, yes, I think I can say that I've made as many as five autopsies. The attorney, exultant and with a scornful smile walking toward the witness, well, sir, why beat about the bush? Let's put it this way. Can you say you have made 10,000 previous autopsies? The doctor, with a broad, rather amused smile on his face, but still in a low tone. Well, I think I can truthfully say I probably have. You see, I was a coroner for 40 years in the city of Berlin before I came to this country. Close quote. On the other hand, some careful and judicious questions seeking to bring out separate facts and separate points from the knowledge and experience of the expert, which will tend to support the theory of the attorney's own side of the case, are usually productive of good results. In other words, the art of the cross-examiner should be directed to bring out such scientific facts from the knowledge of the expert as will help his own case and thus tend to destroy the weight of the opinion of the expert given against him. Another suggestion which should always be borne in mind is that no question should be put to an expert which is in any way so broad as to give the expert an opportunity to expatiate upon his own views and thus afford him an opportunity in his answer to give his reasons in his own way for his op opinions, which counsel calling him as an expert might not otherwise have fully brought out in his examination. It was in the trial of Dr. Buchanan on the charge of murdering his wife that a single ill-advised question put upon cross-examination to the physician who had attended Mrs. Buchanan upon her deathbed and who had given it as his opinion that her death was due to natural causes enabled the jury, after 24 hours of dispute among themselves, finally to agree against the prisoner on a verdict of murder in the first degree resulting in Buchanan's execution. The charge against Dr. Buchanan was that he had poisoned his wife a woman considerably older than himself who had made a will in his favor with morphine and atropine, each drug being used in such proportion as to effectually obliterate the group of symptoms attending death when resulting from the use of either drug alone. At Buchanan's trial, District Attorney Nickel and I found ourselves in the extremely awkward position of trying to persuade a jury to decide that Mrs. Buchanan's death was, beyond all reasonable doubt, the result of an overdose of morphine mixed with atropine administered by her husband, despite the fact that a respectable physician who had attended her at her deathbed had given it as his opinion that she died from natural causes and had himself made out a death certificate in which he attributed her death to apoplexy. It was only fair to the prisoner that he should be given the benefit of the testimony of this physician. The district attorney, therefore, called the doctor to the witness stand and questioned him concerning the symptoms he had observed during his treatment of Mrs. Buchanan just prior to her death and developed the fact that the doctor had made out a death certificate in which he had certified that, in his opinion, apoplexy was the sole cause of death. The doctor was then turned over to the lawyers for the defense for cross-examination. One of the prisoner's counsel, who had far more knowledge of medicine than he did of the art of cross-examination, was assigned the important duty of cross-examining this witness. After badgering the doctor for an hour or so with technical medical questions more or less remote from the subject under discussion and tending to show the erudition of the lawyer who was conducting the examination rather than to throw light upon the inquiry uppermost in the minds of the jury, the cross-examiner finally produced the death certificate and put it in evidence and called the doctor's attention to the statement therein made, that death was the result of apoplexy, exclaimed while flourishing the paper in the air. Quote, Now, doctor, you have told us what this lady's symptoms were. You have told us what you then believed was the cause of her death. I now ask you, has anything transpired since Mrs. Buchanan's death which would lead you to change your opinion as it expressed in this paper, the death certificate? Close quote. The doctor settled back in his chair and slowly repeated the question asked. Quote, has 
anything transpired since Mrs. Buchanan's death, which would lead me to change my opinion as it ex- is expressed in this death certificate. Close quote. The witness turned to the judge and inquired if in answer to such a question he would be allowed to speak of matters that had come to his knowledge since he wrote the certificate. The judge replied, Well, the question is a broad one. Counsel asks you if you know of any reason why you should change your former opinion. The witness leaned forward to the sonographer and requested him to read the question over again. This was done. The attention of everybody in court was by this time focused upon the witness, intent upon his answer. It seemed to appear to the jury as if this must be the turning point of the case. The doctor, having heard the question read a second time, paused for a moment, and then straightening himself in his chair, turned to the cross-examiner and said, I wish to ask you a question. Has the report of the chemist telling of his discovery of atropine and morphine in the contents of this woman's stomach been offered in evidence yet? The court answered, it has not. One more question, said the doctor. Has the report of the pathologist yet been received in evidence? The court replied, no. Then, said the doctor, rising in his chair, I can answer your question truthfully, that as yet, in the absence of the pathological report and in the absence of the chemical report, I know of no legal evidence, which would cause me to alter the opinion expressed in my death certificate. It is impossible to exaggerate the impression made upon the court and jury by these answers. All the advantage that the prisoner might have derived from the original death certificate was entirely swept away. The trial lasted for fully two weeks after this episode. When the jury retired to the consultation room at the end of the trial, they found they were utterly unable to agree upon a verdict. They argued among themselves for 24 hours without coming to any conclusion. At the expiration of this time, the jury returned to the courtroom and asked to have the testimony of this doctor re-read to them by the stenographer. The stenographer, as he read from his notes, reproduced the entire scene which had been enacted two weeks before. The jury retired a second time and immediately agreed upon their verdict of death, meaning death sentence. The cross-examinations of the medical witnesses in the Buchanan case conducted by this quote-unquote medical legal wonder of an attorney were the subject of very extended newspaper praise at the time, one daily paper devoting the entire front page of its Sunday edition to his portrait. The whole effect of the testimony of an expert witness may sometimes effectually be destroyed by putting the witness to some unexpected and offhand test at the trial as to his experience, his ability, and discrimination as an expert so that in case of his failure to meet the test, he can be held up to ridicule before the jury. And thus, the laughter at his expense will cause the jury to forget anything of weight that he has said against you. I have always found this to be the most effective method to cross-examine a certain type of professional medical witness now so frequently seen in our courts. A striking instance of the efficacy of this style of cross-examination was experienced by the writer in a damage suit against the city of New York tried in the Supreme Court sometime in 1887. A very prominent physician, president of one of our leading clubs at the time, but now dead, had advised a woman who had been his housekeeper for 30 years and who had broken her ankle in consequence of stepping into an unprotected hole in the street pavement to bring suit against the city to recover $40,000 in damages. There was very little defense to the principal cause of action. The hole in the street was there and the plaintiff had stepped in it. But her right to recover substantial damages was vigorously contested. Her principal, in fact, her only medical witness was her employer, the famous physician. The doctor testified to the plaintiff's sufferings, described the fracture of her ankle, explained how he had himself set the bones and attended the patient, but affirmed that all his efforts were of no avail as he could bring about nothing but a most imperfect union of the bones and that his housekeeper, a most respectable and estimable lady, would be lame for life. His manner on the witness stand was exceedingly dignified and frank and evidently impressed the jury. 
A large verdict of fully $15,000 was certain to be the result unless this witness's hold upon the jury could be broken on his cross-examination. There was no reason known to counsel why this ankle should not have healed promptly, as such fractures usually do. But how to make the jury realize the fact was the question. The intimate personal acquaintance between the cross-examiner and the witness was another embarrassment. My cross-examination began by showing that the witness, although a graduate of Harvard, had not immediately entered a medical school, but on the contrary had started in business in Wall Street, had later been manager of several business enterprises, and had not begun the study of medicine until he was 40 years old. The examination then continued in the most amiable manner possible, each question being asked in a tone almost of apology. Lawyer, we all know, doctor, that you have a large and lucrative family practice as a general practitioner, but is it not a fact that in this great city where accidents are of such common occurrence, surgical cases are usually taken to the hospitals and cared for by experienced surgeons? Doctor, uh, yes, sir, that is so. Lawyer, you do not even claim to be an experienced surgeon. Doctor, oh, no, sir, I have the experience of any general practitioner. Lawyer, what would be the surgical name for the particular form of fracture that this lady suffered? Doctor, it's what is known as a POTS fracture of the ankle. Lawyer, that is a well-recognized form of fracture, is it not? The doctor, oh, yes. The lawyer, chancing it. Would you mind telling the jury about when you had a fracture of this nature in your regular practice, the last before this one? The doctor, dodging. I should not feel at liberty to disclose the names of my patients. Counsel, the lawyer, encouraged. I'm not asking for names and secrets of patients. Far from it. I'm only asking for the date, doctor, but on your oath. Doctor. Oh, I couldn't possibly give you the date, sir. Lawyer, still feeling his way. Was it within the year preceding this one? The doctor, hesitating. I would not like to say, sir. The lawyer, still more encouraged. I'm sorry to press you, sir, but I'm obliged to demand a positive answer from you whether or not you had had a similar case of POTS fracture of the ankle the year preceding this one. Doctor, well, no, I cannot remember that I had. Lawyer, did you have one two years before? Doctor, I can't say. Lawyer, forcing the issue. Did you have one within five years preceding the plaintiff's case? Doctor, I am unable to say positively. Lawyer, appreciating the danger of pressing the inquiry further, but as a last resort, will you swear that you ever had a case of POTS fracture within your own practice before this one? I tell you frankly, if you say you have, I shall ask you the day and date, time, place, and circumstance. The doctor, much embarrassed. Your question is an embarrassing one. I, I should want time to search my memory. Lawyer, I'm only asking you for your best memory as a gentleman and under oath. Doctor, if you put it that way, I will say that I cannot now remember any case previous to the one in question, excepting as a student in the hospitals. Lawyer, but does it not require a great deal of practice and experience to attend successfully so serious a fracture as that involving the ankle joint? Doctor, oh yes. Lawyer, well, doctor, speaking frankly, won't you admit that POTS fractures are daily being attended to in our hospitals by experienced men and the use of the ankle fully restored in a few months' time? Doctor, that may be, but much depends upon the age of the patient. And again, in some cases, nothing seems to make the bones unite. Counsel, stooping under the table and taking up the two lower bones of the leg attached and approaching the witness... So this would be an artificial skeleton of the lower leg, folks. Will you please take these, doctor, and tell the jury whether in life they constituted the bones of a woman's leg or a man's leg? Doctor, well, it's difficult to tell, sir. Lawyer, what? You can't tell the skeleton of a woman's leg from a man's, doctor? The doctor, oh, oh yes, I, I should say it was a woman's leg. The lawyer, smiling and looking pleased. So, in your opinion, this was a woman's leg? It was, in fact, 
a woman's leg. Doctor, observing counsel's face and thinking he had made a mistake, oh, I beg your pardon, it's a man's leg, of course. I, I had not examined it carefully. By this time, the jury were all sitting upright in their seats and evinced much amusement at the doctor's increasing embarrassment. The lawyer, still smiling, would you be good enough to tell the jury if it is a right leg or the left leg? Doctor, quietly but hesitatingly, it is very difficult, by the way, for the inexperienced to distinguish right from leg. Uh, this is the right leg. Lawyer, astonished. What did you say, doctor? The doctor, much confused. Uh, pardon me, it's the left leg. The lawyer, were you not right the first time, doctor? Is this not, in fact, the right leg? Doctor, I don't think so. No, it's the left leg. The lawyer, again stooping and bringing from under the table the bones of the foot attached together and handing it to the doctor. Uh, please put the skeleton of the foot into the ankle joint of the bones you already have in your hand and then tell me whether it is the right or left leg. The doctor, confidently. Yes, it, it's the left leg, as I said before. The lawyer, uproariously. But doctor, don't you see you've inserted the foot into the knee joint? Is that the way it is in life? The doctor, amid roars of laughter from the jury, in which the entire room joined, hastily readjusted the bones and sat blushing to the roots of his hair. Counsel waited until the laughter had subsided and then said quietly, I think I will not trouble you further, doctor. This incident is not the least bit exaggerated. On the contrary, the impression made by the occurrence is difficult to present adequately on paper. Counsel on both sides proceeded to sum up the case and upon the part of the defense, no allusion whatsoever was made to the incident just described. The jury appreciated the fact and returned a verdict for the plaintiff for $240. Next day, the learned doctor wrote a four-page letter of thanks and appreciation that the results of his stage fright had not been spread before the jury in closing speech. As distinguished from the lengthy though doubtless scientific cross-examination of experts in handwriting with which the profession has become familiar in many recent famous trials that have occurred in this city, New York City. The following incident cannot fail to serve as a forcible illustration of the suggestions laid down as to the cross-examination of specialists. It would almost be thought improbable in a romance, yet every word of it is true, which I can confidently assert as I tried the case myself. Frank Biff Ellison was accused of felonious assault upon one William Henriquez, who had brought Mr. Ellison's attentions to Mr. Henriquez's daughter, Mrs. Leela Nome, to a sudden close by forbidding him his house. At the trial, the authenticity of some letters alleged to have been written by Mrs. Nome to Mr. Ellison was brought in question. The lady herself had strenuously denied that the alleged compromising documents had ever been written by her. Counsel for Ellison, the defendant, the late Charles Brooks, had evidently framed his whole cross-examination of Mrs. Nome upon these letters and made a final effort to introduce them in evidence by calling Professor Ames, the well-known expert in handwriting. He deposed to having closely studied the letters in question in conjunction with an admittedly genuine specimen of the lady's handwriting and gave it as his opinion that they were all written by the same hand. Mr. Brooks then offered the letters in evidence and was about to read them to the jury when the assistant district attorney asked permission to put a few questions. District Attorney, Mr. Ames, as I understand you, you were given only one sample of the lady's genuine handwriting and you base your opinion upon that single exhibit. Is that correct? Witness, the handwriting expert. Yes, sir, there was only one letter given me, but that was quite a long one and afforded me great opportunity for comparison. District Attorney, would it not assist you if you were given a number of her letters with which to make a comparison? Witness, oh yes, the more samples I had of genuine handwriting, the more valuable my conclusion would become. District Attorney, taking from among a bundle of papers a letter, folding down the signature and handing it to the witness. Would you mind taking this one and comparing it with the others and then tell me if that is in the same handwriting? The witness, examining the paper closely for a few minutes. Yes, sir, I, I should say this was the same handwriting. 
District Attorney, is it not a fact, sir, that the same individual may write a variety of hands upon different occasions and with different pens? Witness, oh, yes, sir, they, they might vary somewhat. District Attorney, taking a second letter from his files, also folding over the signature and handing it to the witness. Won't you kindly take this letter also and compare it with the others you have? Witness, examining the letter, yes, sir, this is a variety of the same penmanship. District Attorney, would you be willing to give it as your opinion that it was written by the same person? Witness, I certainly would, sir. District Attorney taking a third letter from his files, again folding over the signature and handing it to the witness. Be good enough to take just one more sample. I don't want to weary you. And say if this last one is also in the lady's handwriting. Witness appearing to examine it closely, leaving the witness chair and going to the window to complete his inspection. Yes, sir. You understand I'm, I'm not swearing to a fact, only an opinion. District Attorney, good-naturedly, of course, of course I understand, but it is your honest opinion as an expert that these three letters are all in the same handwriting. Witness, I say yes, it is my honest opinion. District Attorney, now, sir, won't you please turn down the edge where I folded over the signature to the first letter I handed you and read it aloud to the jury? Witness, unfolding the letter and reading triumphantly, Leela, no. District Attorney, please unfold the second letter and read the signature. The witness reading, William Henriquez. District Attorney, now the third, please. Witness, hesitating and reading with much embarrassment, Frank Ellison. The alleged compromising letters were never read to the jury. It will not be uninteresting by way of contrast, I think, to record here another instance where the cross-examination of an expert in handwriting did more to convict a prisoner, probably, than any other one piece of evidence during the entire trial. The examination referred to occurred in the famous trial of Monroe Edwards, who was indicted for forging two drafts, meaning checks, upon Brown Brothers and Company, who had offered a reward of $20,000 for his arrest. Edwards had engaged Mr. Robert Emmett to defend him and had associated with Emmett as his counsel, Mr. William M. Evarts, and several famous lawyers from outside the state. At that time, the district attorney was Mr. James Whiting, who had four prominent lawyers, including Mr. Ogden Hoffman, associated with him upon the side of the government. Recorder Vox of Philadelphia was called to the witness stand as an expert in handwriting and in his direct testimony had very clearly identified the prisoner with the commission of this particular forgery for which he was on trial. He was then turned over to Mr. Emmett for cross-examination. Mr. Emmett, taking a letter from among his papers and handing it to the witness after turning down the signature. Would you be good enough to tell me, Mr. Vaugh, who was the author of the letter which I now hand you? Mr. Vaugh, answering promptly, this letter is in the handwriting of Monroe Edwards. Mr. Emmett, do you feel certain of that, Mr. Vaugh? Mr. Vaugh, I do. Mr. Emmett, as certain as you are in relation to the handwriting of the letters which you have previously identified as having been written by the prisoner? Mr. Vaugh, exactly the same. Mr. Emmett, you have no hesitation then in swearing positively the, the letter you hold in your hand, in your opinion, was written by Monroe Edwards? Mr. Vaux, not the slightest. Mr. Emmett, with a sneer, that will do, sir. District Attorney, rising quickly, let me see the letter. Mr. Emmett, contemptuously, that is your privilege, sir, but I doubt if it will be to your profit. The letter is directed to myself and is written by the cashier of the Orleans Bank, informing me of a sum of money deposited in that institution to the credit of the prisoner. Mr. Vaux's evidence in relation to it will test the value of his testimony in relation to other equally important points. Mr. Vaux here left the witness chair and walked to the table of the prosecution, re-examined the letter carefully, then reached to a tin box, which was in the keeping of the prosecution and which contained New Orleans post office stamps. He then resumed his seat in the witness chair. Mr. Vaux, smiling, I may be willing, Mr. Emmett, to submit my testimony to your test. Mr. Emmett made no reply, but the prosecuting attorney continued the examination as follows. District Attorney, 
You have testified, Mr. Vo, that you believe the letter, which you now hold in your hand, was written by the same hand that wrote the Caldwell forgeries, and that such hand was Monroe Edwards. Do you still retain that opinion, Mr. Vo? I do. District Attorney, upon what grounds, Mr. Vo? Because it is a fellow of the same character as well in appearance as in device. It is a forgery, probably only intended to impose upon his counsel, but now by its unadvised introduction and evidence, made to impose upon himself and brand him as a forger. The true New Orleans stamps were here shown to be at variance with the counterfeit postmark upon the forged letter, and the character of the writing was also proved by comparison with many letters which were in the forger's undoubted hand. It turned out subsequently that the prisoner had falsely informed his own lawyer, Mr. Emmert, that he was possessed of large amounts of property in Texas, some of which he had ordered to be sold to meet the contingent cost of his defense. He had drawn up a letter, a forged letter, purporting to come from a cashier in a bank at New Orleans directed to Mr. Emmett, informing him of the deposit on that day of $1,500 to the credit of his client which notification he, the cashier, thought proper to send to the council as he had observed in the newspapers that Mr. Edwards was confined to the jail. Mr. Emmett was so entirely deceived by this letter, forged by his own client, that he had taken it to his client in prison and had shown it to him as a sign of pleasant tidings. So to clarify, folks, the client, criminally charged for forgery, had forged a letter he sent to his own lawyer to trick the lawyer into thinking he had the money for the legal defense. That's the reason the two letters matched up. They were, in fact, forgeries written by the defendant, both of them. The manufacture or exaggeration of injuries and damage cases against surface railroads and other corporations had at one time, not many years ago, become almost a trade among a certain class of lawyers in the city of New York. There are several medical books which detail the symptoms that may be expected to be exhibited in, in almost any form of railroad accidents. Any lawyer who is familiar with the pages of these books can readily detect indications of an equal familiarity with them on the part of the lawyer who is examining his client, the plaintiff in an accident case, as to the symptoms of his malady as set forth in these medical treatises, which have probably been put into his hands in order that he may become thoroughly posted upon the symptoms which he would be expected to manifest. In other words, the plaintiff attorney would inform himself of what injuries and symptoms would be expected from an accident on a railroad and basically train his client to repeat those in court. It becomes interesting to watch the history of some of these cases after the substantial amount of the verdict awarded by a jury has been paid over to the suffering plaintiff. Only recently, a couple of medical gentlemen were called as witnesses in a case where a Mrs. Bogardis was suing the Metropolitan Street Railway Company for injuries she claimed to have sustained while a passenger on one of the defendant's cars. These expert physicians swore that Mrs. Bogardis had a lesion of the spine and was suffering from paralysis as a result of the accident. According to the testimony of the doctors, her malady was incurable and permanent. The records of the legal department of this railway company show that these same medical gentlemen had, on prior occasion, in the case of one Hoyt against the railroad, testified to the same state of affairs in regard to Hoyt's physical condition. He, too, was alleged to be suffering from an incurable lesion of the spine and would be paralyzed and helpless for the balance of his life. The records of the company also showed that Hoyt had recovered his health promptly upon being paid the amount of his verdict. At the time of the Bogardus trial, Hoyt had been employed by H.B. Claflin and Company for three years. He was working from 7 in the morning until 6 in the evening, lifting heavy boxes and loading trucks. The moment the physicians had finished their testimony in the Bogardus case, this man, Hoyt, was subpoenaed by the railroad company. On cross-examination, these physicians both recollected the Hoyt case, and their attention was called to the stenographic minutes of the questions and answers they had given under oath in that case. They were then asked if Hoyt was still alive and where he could be found. They both replied that he must be dead by this time, that his case was a hopeless one, and if not dead, he would probably be found as an inmate of one of our public insane asylums. 
At this stage of the proceedings, Hoyt arrived in the courtroom. He was requested to step forward in front of the jury. The doctors were asked to identify him, which they both did. Hoyt then took the witness stand himself and admitted that he had never had a sick moment since the day the jury rendered a verdict in his favor, that he had gained 35 pounds in weight, and that he was then doing work which was harder than any he had ever done before in his life, that he worked from early morning to late at night, had never been in an insane asylum or under the care of any doctor since the trial and ended up by making the astounding statement that out of the verdict rendered him by the jury and paid by the railroad company, he had been obliged to forfeit upwards of $1,500 to the doctors who had treated him and testified in his behalf. This was a little too much enlightenment for the jury in Mrs. Bogarda's case, and this time they rendered their verdict promptly in favor of the railroad company. I cannot forbear relating in this connection another most striking instance of the unreliability of expert testimony in personal injury cases. This is especially the case with certain New York physicians who openly confess it to be part of their professional business to give expert medical testimony in court. Some of these men have taken a course at a law school in connection with their medical studies for the very purpose of fitting themselves for the witness stand as medical experts. One of these gentlemen gave testimony in a recent case which should forever brand him as a dangerous witness in any subsequent litigation in which he may appear. I have reference to the trial of Ellen McQuaid against the Metropolitan Street Railway Company. This was the suit brought on behalf of the next of kin to recover damages for the death of John McQuaid, who had fallen from a surface railway car and had broken his wrist so that the bone penetrated the skin. This wound was slow in healing and did not close entirely until some three months later. About six months after his accident, McQuaid was suddenly taken ill and died. An autopsy disclosed the fact that death resulted from inflammation of the brain, and the effort of the expert testimony in the case was to connect this abscess of the brain with the accident to the wrist, which had occurred six months earlier. This expert doctor had, of course, never seen McQuaid in his lifetime and knew nothing about the case except what was contained in the hypothetical question which he was called upon to answer. He gave it as his opinion that the broken wrist was the direct cause of the abscess in the brain, which was due to a pus germ that had traveled from the wound in the arm by means of the lymphatics up to the brain, where had and had found lodgment and developed into an abscess of the brain, causing death. The contention of the railway company was that the disease condition of the brain was due to middle ear disease, which itself was the result of a cold or exposure, and in no wise connected with the accident, and that the presence of the large amount of fluid which was found in the brain after death could be accounted for only by this disease. During the cross-examination of this medical expert, a young woman wearing a veil had come into court and was requested to step forward and lift her veil. The doctor was then asked to identify her as a Miss Zimmer, for whom he had testified some years previously in her damage suit against the same railway company. At her own trial, Miss Zimmer had been carried into the courtroom, resting in a reclining chair, apparently unable to move her lower limbs, and this doctor had testified that she was suffering from chronic myelitis, an affection of the spine, which caused her to be paralyzed, and that she would never be able to move her lower limbs. His oracular words to the jury were, just as she is now, gentlemen, so she will always be. The witness's attention was called to these statements, and he was confronted with Miss Zimmer, now apparently in the full vigor of her health, and who had for many years been acting as a trained nurse. She afterward took the witness stand and admitted that the jury had found a verdict for her in the sum of $15,000, but that her paralysis had so much improved after the administration of this panacea by the railroad company that she was able, after a few months, to get about with the aid of crutches, and shortly thereafter, regain the normal use of her limbs, and has ever since earned her livelihood as an obstetrical nurse. The sensation caused by the appearance of the Zimmer woman had hardly subsided when the witness's attention was drawn to another case, 
Kelly against a railroad company in which this doctor had also assisted the plaintiff. Kelly was really paralyzed, but claimed that his paralysis was due to a recent railroad accident. It appeared during the trial, however, that long before the alleged railroad accident, Kelly had lost the use of his limbs, and that his case had become so notorious as to be a subject for public lectures by many reputable city physicians. The doctor was obliged to admit being a witness in that case also, but disclaimed any intentional assistance in the fraud. Sometimes a busy attorney will find himself confronted with a situation that compels him to cross-examine some very intimate professional friend who may be called as a witness against his client. It has happened to me so many times in the course of my practice that I am tempted to relate an amusing incident which occurred some years ago in Chicago. A very well-known doctor had given important testimony in a case where his most intimate friend appeared as opposing counsel. These two men doctor and lawyer, stood equally high in their respective professions and had been close friends for many years and were frequent dinner companions at one another's homes with their wives and children. In fact, they had practically grown up together. The lawyer knew that his friend had testified to his honest opinion, which no amount of cross-examination could weaken. He therefore confined himself to the following few interrogations, And fearing that he could not keep a straight face while he put his questions, he avoided facing the witness at all, keeping his face turned toward a side window. Lawyer. Doctor, you say you are a practicing physician. Have you practiced your profession in the city of Chicago for any length of time? Doctor. Yes, I have been in practice here in Chicago now for about 40 years. Lawyer. Well, doctor, during that time, I presume you have had occasion to treat some of our most prominent citizens, have you not? Doctor, yes, I think I have. Lawyer, by any chance, doctor, were you ever called as a family physician to prescribe for the elder Marshall Field? Doctor, yes, I was his family physician for a number of years. Lawyer, by the way, I haven't heard of him lately. Where where is he now? Still looking out the window. Doctor, well, he's dead. Lawyer, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Were you ever the family physician to the elder Mr. McCormick? Doctor, "Uh, yes, also for many years. Lawyer, would you mind my asking where he is now? Doctor, well, he's dead. Lawyer, oh, I'm sorry. Then he proceeded in the same vein to make inquiries about eight or ten of the leading Chicago citizens whom he knew his friend had attended, all of whom were dead, and having exhausted the list, he sat down quietly amid the amused chuckles of the jurors with the comment, I don't think it's necessary to ask you any more questions. Please step down. An eminent x-ray specialist sued for malpractice by his patient faced a claim that in treating her for cancer, He had negligently used the x-ray apparatus with the result that the plaintiff became permanently incapacitated and lost the use of one of her legs. The x-ray had admittedly caused a certain deterioration of the tissues, but the defense was that this was unavoidable. Dr. Philip G. Hood was sworn as an expert for the plaintiff. On direct examination, he testified that there had been excessive dosage, that the patient's condition had received more x-ray than it could stand. Mr. Lloyd P. Stryker cross-examined Dr. Hood as follows. Lawyer. Doctor, are you admitted to practice in New York State? Doctor. Yes, sir. Lawyer. You believe in x-ray, don't you? Doctor. With regard to therapy, you mean? Lawyer. You believe an x-ray is a proper therapeutic agency in the practice of medicine? Doctor. Yes, I do. Lawyer. And it is a proper and approved method in assisting the treatment of disease, is it not? Doctor. It is. Lawyer. And there are two types of x-ray therapy, one superficial and the other deep. Is that not correct? Doctor. That is true. Lawyer. Did I understand you to say, doctor on your direct examination that you dealt in superficial x-ray therapy? Doctor. Yes, while I was connected with the skin and cancer hospital. Lawyer. So while you were there, you had to do only with the superficial variety of that specialty. 
Doctor, yes, sir. Lawyer, what is the difference between superficial and deep therapy? Doctor, superficial therapy is the treatment of lesions on the skin and deep therapy of the deeper structures. Lawyer, have you treated the deeper structures as well? Doctor, yes, sir. Lawyer, you do that now? Doctor, I do it now. Lawyer, deep therapy is recognized, is it not, as a proper and approved method of treating sarcomatous or malignant conditions? Doctor, it is. Lawyer, in order to reach those conditions and have the x-ray affect them, it is necessary to have the electric x-rays, or whatever rays they are, we don't know, do we, what they are, reach into the tissues through the outer skin, the fat and the fascia, down to the place where the cancer is. Doctor, that is true. Lawyer, in other words, the x-ray has to find this growth of the cancer in the same way as if it were done by surgery, that a knife would be used to find it. Do I make myself plain? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, in other words, it has to reach it in order to affect it. Doctor, yes, of course. Lawyer, how deep the x-rays extend into the body depends upon the particular condition that you are treating, does it not? Doctor, the depth of the x-rays depends upon the penetration of them. Lawyer, the depth of the cancer you are treating or their sarcoma, whatever growth you are treating? Doctor, yes, of course. Lawyer, so that if you have a deep-seated malignant growth, your rays have to go very deep, don't they? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, you don't criticize sending the rays as deep as the cancer is, do you? Doctor, no. Lawyer, what effect do those x-rays have upon the growths when they reach them? Doctor, it causes a death of the new tumor cells. Lawyer, sarcoma is a disease of the cells, is it, or of the connecting tissues? Doctor, it is of the connective tissue. Lawyer, and if the connective tissues between the cells are affected, cancerous growths, the x-ray therapist must send his x-ray in as deep as those are, mustn't he? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, in order to perform x-ray therapy, is it necessary to resort to all the recognized methods of diagnosis available to the medical profession? Is that correct? Doctor, surely. Lawyer, and it is proper and approved practice to resort to those methods? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, is that not true? Doctor, yes. And among those methods are the taking of x-ray pictures. Doctor, true. Lawyer, that is correct, isn't it? Doctor, yes, it is. Lawyer, you don't criticize the doctor here for taking x-ray pictures in connection with his diagnosis, do you? Doctor, I do not. Lawyer, for instance, the deposition which you said you have read of the doctor who has been called as the plaintiff's witness, page 4, quote, I made an x-ray examination and I confirmed that diagnosis, close quote, that is proper and approved practice, isn't it? Doctor, yes, sir. Lawyer, when these x-rays from this machine reach into the deep tissue to this cancerous or sarcomatous growth, they destroy the growth? That's the purpose of the rays? Doctor, they do, yes. Lawyer, and sometimes do those rays, when they go very deep, have some effect upon the tissues between the sarcomatous growth and the external part of the body? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, sometimes a greater effect than even an ordinary erythema? Doctor, on the deeper structures. Lawyer, well, on the superficial structures? Doctor, I suppose they might have an effect on the skin. Lawyer, as a matter of fact, they do have, don't they? Doctor, yes, I think I could say, yes. Lawyer, in other words, this heavy voltage of x-ray shot into a depth of the body to attack a cancer will have some effect on that which it goes through to reach the cancer. Doctor, yes. Lawyer, in x-ray therapy, deep therapy, where you are after sarcoma or a cancer, what you are looking for is to get at that cancer, isn't it? Doctor, true. Lawyer, in the same way that a surgeon in going after a disease condition, we will say in the abdomen, will make a slit in the body with which his knife to go in for it, isn't that so? Doctor, that is true. Lawyer, the theory is the same? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, 
The ultimate object of the doctor is to get out the seat of the disease and attack it and eliminate it. That is the purpose of it all, isn't it? Doctor, yes, sir. Lawyer, the same purpose in x-ray therapy as in surgery. Am I right? Doctor, you are right. Lawyer, then in order to do that, it is proper, isn't it, for the doctor to consider primarily the ultimate enemy that he is attacking, namely the cancer? That is right, isn't it? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, and what intervenes between the enemy, the cancer, and the outside is an incident to the attacking of the real thing. Isn't that correct? Doctor, yes, sir. Lawyer, sometimes then, in order to make this attack, one of the incidents of the attack is some effect upon the fat and fascia through which you go to get at the cancer. Isn't that true? Answer, that is true. Lawyer, did you assume in this case that this growth was deep? Or not deep? Doctor, from my own examination? Lawyer, no, no, not at all. From the facts in this case, the testimony of the doctor who has been called as the plaintiff's witness. Doctor, that it was just below the skin? I understood it to be just below the skin. Lawyer, and have you given your whole opinion upon that basis? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, if you were wrong in that assumption of fact, that would alter your opinion? Doctor, yes. Lawyer, in other words, if this particular mass were not just below the skin, but extended down to the bone, the criticism which you suggested, at least by your testimony, you would naturally take back, wouldn't you? Doctor, yes, sir. Lawyer, I call your attention to the testimony of the doctor in this case called as plaintiff's witness. Quote, did you make a diagnosis independent of Dr. Schwartz? Answer. I made an x-ray examination and I confirmed that diagnosis. The x-ray examination showed the mass to extend into the soft tissues down to the bone. Close quote. Now, assuming that to be a fact, you will withdraw your criticism, will you not? Doctor, yes. An appeal was taken and thereafter withdrawn. One of the greatest vices of expert medical testimony is the hypothetical question and answer, which have come to play so important a part in our trials nowadays. This is perhaps the most abominable form of evidence that was ever allowed to choke the mind of a juror or throttle his intelligence. A hypothetical question is supposed to be an accurate synopsis of the testimony that has already been sworn to by various witnesses who have preceded the appearance of the medical expert in the case. The doctor is then asked to assume the truth of every fact which counsel has included in his question and to give the jury his opinion and conclusions as an expert from these supposed facts. It frequently happens that the physician has never even seen, much less examined, the patient concerning whose condition he is giving sworn testimony. Nine times out of ten, the jury take the answer of the witness as direct evidence of the existence of the fact itself. It is the duty of the cross-examiner to enlighten the jury in regard to such questions and make them realize that it is not usually the truth of the answer, but the truth and accuracy of the question which requires their consideration. These hypothetical questions are usually loosely and inaccurately framed and present a very different aspect of the case from that which the testimony of the witnesses would justify. If, however, the question is substantially correct, it is allowed to be put to the witness. The damaging answer follows, and the jury conclude that the plaintiff is certainly suffering from the dreadful or incurable malady the doctor has apparently sworn to. A clever cross-examiner is frequently able to shatter the injurious effect of such hypothetical questions. One useful method is to rise and demand of the physician that he repeat in substance the question that had just been put to him and upon which he bases his answer. The stumbling effort of the witness to recall the various stages of the question, such questions are usually very long, opens the eyes of the jury at once to the dangers of such testimony. It is not always safe, however, to make this inquiry. It all depends upon the character of witness you are examining. Some doctors, before being sworn as witnesses, study carefully the typewritten hypothetical questions which they are to answer. A single inquiry will easily develop this phase of the matter, and if the witness answers that he has previously read the question, it is often useful to ask him which particular part of it he lays the most stress upon, and which parts he could throw out altogether. Thus, 
one may gradually narrow him down to some particular factor in the hypothetical question, which the truth of which the previous testimony in the case might have left in considerable doubt. It will often turn out that a single sentence or twist in the question serves as a foundation for the entire answer of the witness. This is especially the case with con conscientious physicians who often suggest to counsel the addition of a few words which will enable them to answer the entire question as desired. The development of this fact alone will do much to destroy the witness with the jury. I discovered once, upon cross-examining one of our most eminent physicians, that he had added the words, can you say with positiveness to a lawyer's hypothetical question, and then had taken the stand and answered the question in the negative. Although, had he been asked for his honest opinion on the subject, he would have been obliged to give a different answer. Hypothetical questions put in behalf of a plaintiff would not, of course, include facts which might develop later for the defense. When cross-examining to such questions, therefore, it is often useful to inquire in what respect the witness would modify his answer if he were to assume the truth of these new factors in the case. Quote, supposing that in addition to the matters you have already considered, there were to be added the facts that I will now give you, etc. What would your opinion be then, etc.? Close quote. Henry W. Taft has, of late years, frequently been called upon in our surrogate's court to establish the validity of wills drawn in his office, which, like the majority of wills involving large sums of money, are attacked by disappointed relatives. Mr. Taft has a method quite his own in his cross-examinations when dealing with expert witnesses who have given the stereotyped answer negativing the mental capacity of the testator to make a will, after listening to the reading of a long hypothetical question embodying most of the facts brought out by the opponents of the will and omitting many of the important features of the proponent's evidence. Mr. Taft persuades the witness to forget the hypothetical question for the moment and to try to imagine himself not as an expert witness testifying to the mental capacity of a dead man with whom he has never had any personal contact, but as being called into consultation before the will was executed to pass upon the mental capacity of the man while still living. Naturally, the witness admits that he would first of all wish to examine the individual himself and apply the various tests known to his profession to determine his exact mental condition. Having completed his own examination, his next step would be a questioning of the attending family physician. By easy stages, Mr. Taft has the witness making inquiries of the attendant nurses, the inmates of the household, and all persons in close and intimate contact with the testator until, unwittingly, the doctor finds that he has admitted that he would have formulated his opinion upon the statements of the very witnesses who have already testified in court in favor of the will. I quote from an article written by Mr. Taft and printed in the New York Sun. Quote, Recently, I tried a contested will case in which three of the most eminent alienists in the country testified that the testator, who had suffered from a stroke of apoplexy, indicating a lesion of the brain, and had committed suicide, was not competent to execute a will. The surrogate directed a verdict sustaining the will, thus ruling against the opinion of the experts that the testator was competent. The decision was unanimously sustained by the Appellate Division and the Court of Appeals, thus in effect deciding that the uncontradicted testimony of the three eminent alienists did not rise to the dignity of legal evidence. And yet, the time of the courts continues to be occupied by testimony of expert witnesses, the public is put to an enormous expense by protracted trials, and the litigants themselves pay enormous fees to medical experts. Close quote. Frequently, hypothetical questions are so framed that they answer themselves by begging the question. In the Gatow case, all the medical experts were asked, in effect, though not in form, to assume that a man having an hereditary taint of insanity exhibits his insanity in his youth, exhibits it in his manhood, and at a subsequent date, being under the insane delusion that he was authorized and commanded by God to kill the President of the United States, 
proceeded without cause to kill him. And upon these assumptions, the experts were asked to give their opinion whether such a man was sane or insane. To pick out the flaws in most hypothetical questions, to single out the particular sentence, adjective, or adverb upon which the physician is centering his attention as he takes his oath, requires no little experience and astuteness. Mr. Henry W. Taft has written frequent articles touching on hypothetical questions. In one of his pamphlets, Opinion Evidence of Medical Witnesses, he concludes with this broad statement, quote, Where the mental condition of a person is under examination and opinion evidence is in hopeless conflict, it frequently happens that it has little weight attached to it. This is no more than saying that in vigorously contested lawsuits, the tendency of human beings is to base their action on concrete facts rather than upon theories as to which scientists themselves do not agree. In my own state of New York, it has been recently held that the uncontradicted evidence of medical experts does not alone constitute a scintilla of proof requiring even that a case should be submitted to a jury, close quote. And in the Tracy Peerage case, Lord Campbell said of expert witnesses that, quote, hardly any weight should be given to their evidence, close quote. Few lawyers would contend that the present method in civil cases of investigating matters involving the science of medicine is efficient. Bar associations and bar reformers have for years sought to remedy its defects. But so long as there are specialists, lay juries will have to wrestle with disputed questions as best they may. I quote here from Stevens, On trial by jury and the evidence of experts, quote, Few spectacles, it may be said, can be more absurd and incongruous than that of a jury composed of 12 persons who, without any previous scientific knowledge or training, are suddenly called upon to adjudicate in controversies in which the most eminent scientific men flatly contradict each other's assertions. How, it might be asked, can ordinary tradesmen and farmers who have never been accustomed to give sustained attention to any subject whatever for an hour together be expected to weigh evidence, the delivery of which occupies many days and which bears upon subjects which can only be described in language altogether new and foreign to their understandings. It is indeed a weighty and important reflection that men actually have at times to judge and that it matters of life and death upon scientific evidence without sitting on juries. A man observes a small swelling on his thigh. He goes to a surgeon who says, This is an aneurysm, and if you do not allow me to cut down upon the artery and tie it, you may fall dead at any moment. He shows the same thing to another doctor who says, it's no aneurysm at all, but a mere tumor on which I will operate. If I do not, you will be exposed to some dreadful consequence or other. But if I am wrong, and it is an aneurysm, as soon as I make the first cut, you are a dead man. Here a man is judge of life and death in his own case, nor can he escape the necessity of deciding. He would, if a man of sense, probably be able to come to a pretty clear conclusion as to whether he should trust the first surgeon or the second, although he might know very little of surgery. Close quote. Where opinion evidence is sought to be obtained on hypothetical questions concerning the mental condition of a deceased person at a given time, there is room for honest and often wide differences of opinion. But when enormous fees are to be paid to so-called expert witnesses, and especially where, as frequently happens, their compensation is dependent upon the result of a trial, the best of them may be unconsciously influenced in their judgment, while the opinions of the less scrupulous may be purposely adjusted to the financial interest. I would cover the subject very inadequately if I did not emphasize the absurdities introduced into legal procedure by the hypothetical question. This is particularly the case in that large class of probate litigation where the mental capacity of a testator is under examination. Mr. Taft says, quote, Under the procedure in my own state, both the proponent of a will and the contestant call one or more medical experts whose testimony is elicited by hypothetical questions which assume the truth of facts which are summarized, however slight the evidence may be, to establish them. If a jury finds any of the assumed facts to be untrue or incredible, the elaborate structure of the question itself and the answer of the witness 
falls like a house of cards. It frequently happens that the testimony of the experts is practically ignored, and the jury decides the case solely upon other evidence. But so long as answers to hypothetical questions are admitted, lawyers will not omit to adopt tactics to discredit them. To illustrate the lengths to which hypothetical question has gone, I may mention a contested will case recently tried in New York in which a hypothetical question was propounded to three experts on each side. The two questions together consisted of about 36,000 words, that is, about 36 columns of newspaper print and occupied more than four hours in the reading. I believe that evidence elicited by such questions serves only to unnecessarily occupy the time of the court and to confuse the jury. Close quote. In a later chapter, Mr. Taft's scientific cross-examination of two expert witnesses who had testified positively against him, but whose testimony, after the cross-examination was finished, was given no weight whatever by the presiding surrogate, is given in some detail. In still another chapter, a cross-examination of one of those same expert witnesses by Mr. George Z. Medalli is recorded. A close study of these examples is highly recommended to students and trained lawyers as well. The professional witness is always partisan, ready and eager to serve the party calling him. This fact should be ever present in the mind of the cross-examiner. Encourage the witness to betray his partisanship. Encourage him to volunteer statements and opinions and to give unresponsive answers. Jurors always look with suspicion upon such testimony. Assume that an expert witness called against you has come prepared to do you all the harm he can and will avail himself of every opportunity to do so which you inadvertently give him. Such witnesses are usually shrewd and cunning men and come into court well prepared on the subject concerning which they are to testify. Some experts, however, are mere shams and pretenders. I remember witnessing many years ago the utter collapse of one of these expert pretenders of the medical type. It was in a damage suit against the city, which I defended. The plaintiff's doctor was a loquacious gentleman of considerable personal presence. He testified to a serious head injury and proceeded to lecture the jury on the subject in a sensational and oracular manner, which evidently made a great impression upon them. Even the judge seemed to give more than the usual attention. The doctor talked glibly about vasomotor nerves and reflexes and expressed himself almost entirely in medical terms which the jury did not understand. He polished off his testimony with the prediction that the plaintiff could never recover, and if he lived at all, it would be necessarily be within the precincts of an insane asylum. I saw at a glance that this was no ordinary type of witness. Any cross-examination on the medical side of the case would be sure to fail. For the witness, though evidently dishonest, was yet ingenious enough to cover his tracks by the cuttlefish expedient of befogging his answers in a cloud of medical terms. Dr. Alan McLean Hamilton, who is present as medical advisor in behalf of the city, suggested an expedient which I adopted as follows. Lawyer. Doctor, I infer from the number of books that you have brought here to substantiate your position and from your manner of testifying that you are very familiar with the literature of your profession and especially that part relating to head injury. Doctor, I pride myself that I am. I have not only a large private library, but have spent many months in the libraries of Vienna, Berlin, Paris, and London. Lawyer, then perhaps you are acquainted with Andrew's celebrated work, on the recent and remote effects of head injury? Doctor, smiling superciliously. Well, I should say I was. I had occasion to consult it only last week. Counsel, have you ever come across Charvas on cerebral trauma? Doctor, uh, yes, I have read Dr. Charvas's book from cover to cover many times. Counsel continued in much the same strain, putting to the witness similar questions relating to many other fictitious medical works, all of which the doctor had either studied carefully or had in his library about to read, until finally, suspecting that the doctor was becoming conscious of the trap into which he had been led, counsel suddenly changed his tactics and demanded in a loud, sneering tone if the doctor had ever read page on injuries of the spine and spinal cord, a genuine and most learned treatise on the subject, 
To this inquiry, the doctor laughingly replied, I have never heard of any such book, and I guess you never did either. The climax had been reached. Dr. Hamilton, testifying on my side, was immediately sworn for the defense and explained to the jury his participation in preparing the list of bogus medical works with which the learned expert for the plaintiff had shown such purported familiarity. On the other hand, when the cross-examiner has totally failed to shake the testimony of an able and honest expert, he should be very wary of attempting to discredit him by any slurring allusions to his professional ability, as is well illustrated by the following example of the danger of giving the experts a good chance for a retort. Dr. Joseph Collins, a well-known nerve specialist, was giving testimony recently on the side of the Metropolitan Street Railway case, where the plaintiff claimed to be suffering from a misplaced kidney, which the railroad doctor's examination failed to disclose. Having made nothing out of the cross-examination of Dr. Collins, the plaintiff's lawyer threw this parting boomerang at the witness. Lawyer, after all, doctor, isn't it a fact that nobody in your profession regards you as a surgeon? Doctor, I never regarded myself as one. Lawyer, you are a neurologist, aren't you, doctor? Doctor, I am, sir. Lawyer, a neurologist, pure and simple? Doctor, well, I'm moderately pure and altogether simple. In Los Angeles recently, Milton Carlson, a well-known handwriting expert, turned the tables upon Mr. Horace Apple, a noted local criminal lawyer, in a way that should serve as a warning to careless handling of expert witnesses accustomed to the witness chair. This particular incident occurred during the trial of David Kaplan, who was associated with the McNamara brothers in the dynamiting of the Times building, cases of international importance. The question of handwriting was one of the pivotal points at issue. Carlson was the sole expert relied upon by the prosecution in the Kaplan case. Apple was defending the accused. In the course of his testimony, Carlson made the statement that the opinion of handwriting experts is superior to another person's opinion, even of his own handwriting. Lawyer, do you mean to say that you know more about my handwriting than I do? Asked Mr. Apple, the defense attorney. Answer, I have said that the opinion of an expert is frequently of more weight than the opinion of the person who wrote the questioned writing. Counsel waited for several minutes and then produced a paper on which there appeared a number of sentences and apparently different handwritings. Lawyer, can you tell me if one person wrote these, and if so, how many pens were used? The witness looked at the writing for a moment, asked for more time to examine it. The request was granted, and the expert witness took the writings to his office. After recess, Carlson, who had imitated the question document during the noon hour so that he could discuss it more intelligently, returned to court and inadvertently left the paper, which he had written in imitation of the other, on the table usually occupied by the cross-examining attorney. When Apple, the defense attorney, continued his cross-examination, he picked up this paper, studied it, and apparently recognizing it said, Lawyer, Mr. Expert Witness, if you have sufficiently examined it, please now tell us how many people wrote this paper. Carlson reached for the paper, recognized it at once as his own imitation, and answered politely, one person wrote this, and he wrote it with one pen. The lawyer, are you sure? Answer, absolutely. I will prove that it was written with two pens, for I wrote it myself in this very courtroom, shouted the defense attorney, as he dashed across the courtroom to reach the two pens he had used. Judge Willis then pointed out to the witnesses that he had made a very positive statement and not merely given his opinion, and Carlson again reiterated that he meant to be positive in his statement. The defense attorney refused to cross-examine any further. Just as Carlson started to leave the witness stand, District Attorney Doran took the witness in hand. Question, how do you know one person wrote those statements and that one pen was used? Answer, because, replied the witness, I wrote them myself with one pen in my office at the noon recess. Mr. Apple evidently thought he recognized his own handwriting, and this incident may tend to prove what I said before, that sometimes handwriting experts know more about questioned writing even than the person who wrote it. 
The witness then explained that he had roughly imitated the writing given to him by the lawyer so that he could be more readily explain his points to the jury. That sometimes questioned writings will be convincingly proved without calling an expert, the following will serve as a startling illustration. In a divorce action tried before a referee, part of the evidence introduced against the defendant wife to show an adulterous disposition was a series of exhibits consisting of love letters addressed to the co-respondent and apparently in the undisguised handwriting of the defendant. The wife was sworn as a witness in her own defense and denied the writing of these letters. In one of them occurred the sentence, quote, everyone today was flattering me and it was so empty. The tooch of your dear hand in mine, how it would rest me. When will you be down, dear, and when can we get married? Close quote. As an aside, folks, uh, when I say tooch here, it's supposed to be touch, but it's misspelled. It's spelled as T-O-U-T-C-H. So that's the key to this story here, that touch was misspelled. Upon cross-examination, Colonel William Rand, who was conducting the case for the husband, asked the witness if she would be willing to write for the benefit of the referee. She readily complied with the suggestion, and after removing her glove and choosing pen and pencil to her liking, proceeded to write 15 or more phrases dictated to her by the cross-examiner, first with pen and then with pencil, and in handwriting indistinguishable from that of the exhibits. These contained words selected from the disputed letters offered as evidence, but framed in somewhat different context. Among them was the sentence, in the deep woods, you and I are out of touch with the world. Without hesitation, first with pen and then with pencil, the witness wrote, in the deep woods, you and I are out of touch with the world. And that, folks, is the end of Chapter 5 of The Art of Cross-Examination by Francis Wellman. Chapter 5 being Cross-Examination of Experts. We will, of course, continue in our next show, Law of Self-Defense show, the series of reading this book, The Art of Cross-Examination, with Chapter 6, The Sequence of Cross-Examination, and I certainly hope you'll join me for that. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for self-defense. Stay safe. If you've ever wondered what it would be like to have a lawyer-like understanding of the many high-profile trials and legal issues we cover, well, I've got exciting news. Our very own American Law Courses offer a wide variety of law school-level courses, including the foundational courses all lawyers take in their first year of law school at a fraction of the cost and time of law school and without the toxic political environment that so pervades law schools today. At American Law Courses, we simply teach traditional American law in the traditional American way to help Americans become the best informed, most capable citizens they can be. We have a broad curriculum of courses, including criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, property, constitutional law, and more. All courses are taught on a semester basis, roughly one live-streamed class a week for 14 weeks with an optional final exam for certification at the end. Every class is taught by a genuine legal expert in the respective subject, and because the classes are live-streamed, there's plenty of opportunity for real-time interaction and Q&A with the professor. If you can't make a particular class for some reason, no worries. Every class is also made available as a recorded playback, and you have access to that recording for a full year. We're currently in the pre-registration period for the spring 2023 semester, which starts the second week of January. And during this pre-registration period, you can save 50% on any and all American law courses. That's a savings of over $1,000 a course. So if you'd like to learn more, now would be the time to do so. Learn more about our American law courses, access the syllabus for each course, view interviews with our professors, and much more by simply pointing your browser to AmericanLawCourses.com today.